And there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch of their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. beginning a new message series entitled Advent, but really that series comes on the heels of the beginning of the season of Advent that we are in, and this is in the Christian calendar, and this is, this is something that many of you probably have grown up and uh, done and been a part of and have uh, focused on, but for most of us, uh, myself included, I, I, growing up, I had no idea what Advent was. I'd never heard of it. It wasn't something that our church had really done too much about, and so I, I look forward to not only bringing some of the traditional elements of Advent to this, serv- to this message series, but also looking at the heartbeat behind it and making sure that our eyes and our hearts are focused on God and that we are able to, to move in the right direction and make sure that, that uh, we are um, aiming our lives at what is most important right now, and that is God, and that is the love and the sacrifice that he has paid for us. And, uh, you know, I, I, look at, um, I look at this season, and you guys always hear the saying, pastors will always say, this is like the first thing that we have to come up with when we write a message series for Christmas. It's Jesus is the reason for the... Season, all right. So, yeah. So, you guys have all heard that, uh, and I and I know I've preached messages on it, and we've shared those things before. And and uh, there's there's something that I don't like about that saying. And now, just before you revolt and walk out on me, let me just clarify what I just said. I I don't like it not because it's not true. It's absolutely true. Jesus is the reason for this season. And it's, it's the reason why we need to be focused on God and not just the, the things that are around us. So he is the reason for the season, and there's truth in that, and it's good to be reminded of that. But I think the reason why my heart saddens a little bit sometimes when I hear that is not because of the beautiful reality that's being proclaimed, but because of what it can do in our hearts if we're not careful and if we're not mindful and attentive to uh, making sure that our lives are focused where they need to be focused. If we, if we push, he is the reason for the season, and we fight for that, and I remember last year we fought for that with the Starbucks Red Cups, and you know it was so important. He's the reason for the season. Don't take Christ out of Christmas, and all that, again, is true. All of that is important. But if we as Christians rally only around that, if that's what our anthem is, if that's what our passion is, if we can stand in unity on that and then by and large either forget or begin to slip the rest of the year, I feel then that at that point, that statement maybe does us a disservice. And maybe that's not that way for you. Maybe, maybe you love God and you're passionate on fire for him and you're pursuing him and this is just an additional beautiful add-on. But I would venture to say that the vast majority of Christians, this is what they say during Christmas, but they would not say that the rest of the year, or at least intentionally live that way and proclaim that truth. Really, the truth is, Jesus is not just the reason for the season, Jesus is the reason for our life. He's the reason for every single day, all 365 days of the year, he is our reason. He's the reason that we get up. He's the reason that we minister. He's the reason that we come here. Jesus is the purpose and the driving force behind our life. And so there's nothing wrong with he is the reason for the season as long as that is an add-on to the life that's lived the rest of the year. But if it's just a 
anthem, if it's just something that we say, something that we post on Facebook or as an Instagram in an image in December, if that's all that Jesus resides in and that's the only reason that he is is for that moment right there, then as the church, we have missed it. As Christians, we have missed it. But going back to this idea of Advent, Advent is a Latin word, it means the coming, and it's something of anticipation. In fact, the full definition is the arrival of notable person, thing, or event. I think we could say that very clearly, that that's, that's what Jesus was, a no, not just a notable person, play, uh, an event, a notable thing, person and event, but Jesus truly was the radical, flipping, upside down, life changing, altering viewpoint, a moment that happened in our lives, even though we weren't there 2,000 years ago. But he does it now for every person that puts their trust in Jesus, every person that gives their heart over to God. Jesus comes in and changes us from top to bottom, inside and out. Arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. The coming or the second coming of Christ. And as Christians, that's what we look to. So Advent is a season historically uh, done and, and historically uh, um, uh, done by the church as a season of looking forward to what Christ has done. He's coming as a baby. He's coming as an infant. And this is, this is something that we celebrate. And obviously, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came as an infant, as a child, was born here on this earth, and that's why we celebrate. He was born He's the reason for the season, and then, we, and then many of us, most of us, know the rest of the story, that he lived for 33 years, and then was betrayed, was crucified, murdered on the cross, three days later rose from the dead so that we could be victorious in him. So the, traditionally, churches observe Advent as a looking to what the fact that Jesus, the baby, was coming, which is great. That's wonderful, but that's already happened. And we can celebrate that, and we need to look at that and teach our children about that and remember the beautiful part of that. But Jesus has already come. And so as much as there is advent of Jesus coming the first time, there's also advent remembering, looking forward to, focusing in on Jesus coming the second time. And that's where we live. That's where our lives are at right now is looking forward to the second coming of Christ, of which we'll look at here in a few moments. Many churches uh, celebrate, one of the ways that many churches celebrate Advent is by lighting candles and having an Advent wreath. And that's something that you've been seeing in these videos here. In fact, technically, Advent is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. So we're actually already in the middle of the season of Advent. And so the first candle's been lit, and today we light the second candle. And those candles, depending on what church you go to, but by and large, the, the meanings are the same. Those candles are hope, joy, excuse me, hope, love, joy, and peace. It's reminding us of the attributes of God, of what Christ did for us and who he is. And so over here is an Advent wreath, and what many churches, or even outside of churches, what many people will do at home is they'll gather their children, they'll gather their family around, and they will light the candles, they will read scriptures as we just heard, and they will quiet their hearts. In fact, that's really um, an important element of Advent is us quieting our hearts, removing the noise, pushing out the, the busyness, and focusing on what's most important. And they would light the candles, and as they light the candle they would again say a prayer. They would read a scripture, the first one being hope, the next one being love. And that's truly what Jesus was. He was love per in person, love from heaven brought here on earth. And that's something that this world needs, something that this world is lacking. We have so much stuff so many opportunities, so many things that are set before us, but the one thing that the world tries desperately to mimic and can do for short spurts and for short seasons, tries to represent is this idea of love. I love you. 
you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, or I love chocolate, or, you know, this idea that we can just throw the word love around, but the reality is love is not a feeling. Love is a decision. Love was, love is an action, and it first was the action of Jesus coming. And so the only way for us as Christians to truly love people is for us to act like Christ towards people. Anything short of acting like God towards people and presenting the fullness of God, anything short of that is robbing people. It's a counterfeit. It's a, it's a less than version. And the world is full of less than versions. But if you will live your life transparent so that Christ shines through you and the way that he has commanded us to live our lives that we find all throughout scriptures, but especially in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the spirit, if you will allow yourself to be someone that presents that, you are someone that is retelling the beautiful story of Christ by your words, by your actions, by the amount of times that you go and pray for somebody and give them a word of encouragement and take time to, to show them that they mean something to you and that they're important to you. We are called not just in the season of Advent to remember the action of love, but we are called to live love every single day. The decision, the discipline, and the action of love. We find in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, a prophecy given over 700 years before Jesus actually was born. So 700 years before Jesus Christ came and we now celebrate that, a prophecy was given about Jesus. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. 700 years, it was prophesied that this government would be established, this kingship would take place, that there would be no end to it, that it would be wonderful, that he'd be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace there would be increase. And so the world from that point on and even before that, but especially from that prophecy on, the world who heard that, who had ears to hear, especially the Israelites, they spent their hearts and their lives and their time knowing that any moment their Savior could come. At any moment, every single thing that they're going through that's difficult can be changed. In a moment, they're going to rule and reign with Christ. In a moment, it's going to take place, and it's going to be powerful, and it's going to be majestic, and it's going to be big, and it's going to be, and this is where we start to add our own flavor to what was actually said here. And it's going to be, it's going to be they're going to come in, and it's going to change everything, and everyone's going to bow down, and we kind of start to add to it. And over the years, it becomes, the message becomes distorted a little bit. Water becomes a little bit muddy. There's additional things added to it. There's things that about it that were forgotten, And so 700 years later, Jesus is actually born. And the thing about it is, he didn't come in the way that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, thought they were going to come. They, again, thought something grand and big and and, and epic, and something was going to take place that was undeniable, that was loud, that was in your face. But then here comes Jesus, born to a virgin, who in that society, um, the assumption was that she wasn't a virgin. So she was an outcast. She was shunned. It was was not a good thing. Had to travel. Her parents had to travel long distance just to get where they were going. Was born in a manger, in a place where they held animals at, because in all the suitable places for a king to be born, those were all filled up with people that one day he would save. And he was born in the most unassuming, fragile state you possibly could be, a child. Any of you that have ever held a child, you look, this, this beautiful child, they're beautiful, and, and the thing is, is they're helpless. They, they literally can't do anything. Without help, they can't eat. They, they mess themselves. 
They, they are uncomfortable. I mean, if without help, they're going to die. So here is God himself became flesh, came down here to live with us and among us so that he can save us. And he's born as a child. He doesn't come riding in where everybody is just worshiping his name and bowing down before him and all the trumpets are sounding. He doesn't come in where every single nation has to stop what they're doing and take a note. He comes in as the poorest of the poor in, an, in a very obscure place, Bethlehem. And he begins to grow in wisdom and stature and favor in both, with both man and God. He has to go through the process of being a baby and a toddler and a child and a teenager and learning a trade and growing up and finding out what it means to be a man, what it means to be tempted. Yes, he was tempted. What it means, but the Bible says he didn't sin. What it means to go through the, all the emotions that we went through. In fact, if we ever present Jesus as an emotionless figure that walked here on this earth, we are, we are robbing him of the sacrifice that he made on our behalf and we are, we are setting ourselves up for failure because if he didn't come to be able to identify with us in all that we go through, the good days and the bad days, the temptations, if he didn't identify with us, how could he be our sacrifice? So Jesus came and he grew up and that's the rest of the story continues on and we're going to be looking at, over, at that over the next few weeks. But 700 years from the point in which the prophet Isaiah said what he said about unto us a child is born. And finally, on a clear night, stars out with the shepherds as the audience. Again, not royalty, not, you know, the most popular people, Hollywood's elite. No, with shepherds, quite possibly the, the worst job of its time, the outcasts, the, the people you don't want to talk to because they smell horrible and they're dirty. And that was his audience. Later on, the... The wise leaders came and they presented gifts. But remember, at the end of the day, that first night and the second night and the third night, at the end of the day, baby Jesus was laid down in the same place that animals ate out of. Okay? This is the Lord that we serve. We know that he is victorious. We celebrate that so often. We're going to do that later on with communion. But God himself could have done it probably many different ways, but God himself chose, as the Bible says, to empty himself. He chose to not, not become God, cease to become God. He chose to give up a portion of his divinity, he, to the, the, the right for him to, be, to live above the rest of us. He chose to give that up and the closeness and relationship, the perfect unity between him and, the, his, and our God, our Father, he chose to give that up so that he could save people that literally reject him, laugh at him, spit at him. Not just in that moment, but we still do it today. Christians and non-Christians alike, we still do it today. We... we uh, I'll, you know, just, just take church for an example. And this is the smallest example I'll come to church when I feel like it, if I can make it. Man, Jesus deserves every ounce of our, this, this, this right here above everything else should be the most exciting thing of your week. Yeah. It should be the thing that you like, you know what, I don't care what's going on, I wanna be here. Now I understand there's vacations, I get that guys, and I'm not, I'm not making anybody feel bad because you know, there's, I guarantee you over the next month, tons of people are gonna be gone because that's how you're all traveling and then be able to celebrate family is good and I, I love that. But by and large, we don't even prioritize an hour and a half a week every single week, many of us. And that's just an example of our heart condition as Christians, as a society, as a nation, towards this wonderful, beautiful king. He deserves so much more. He deserves our everything. I want to read a story to you out of Luke chapter 2. It's a little bit long, but I, I kind of want you to, if you will, to get lost in the story and just feel what's going on and understand what's happening. This is right after Jesus was born. Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through 
38. I'll be skipping a few scriptures in the middle. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. Remember, over 700 years ago, there was a prophecy that this would happen. No guarantee as to when it would happen or how it would happen. They just said, it's coming. So he's eagerly waiting for the Messiah. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there, and he took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. So Simeon was promised by God that he would not die before he saw the Messiah. And so the Holy Spirit led Simeon to the temple So here's someone who's devout. Here's someone who's eagerly waiting for the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit leads him to the temple the very day that Jesus is being presented. We're going to continue on in verse 37 where it begins to talk about Anna the prophet, also someone that was waiting for the Messiah. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking to Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. So here's the prophet Anna, and here's Simeon. Both have hearts that are waiting, longing, desiring to see the Messiah, The prophet Anna literally did not leave the temple day and night praying and fasting. Then here's this beautiful moment where a mother and a father bring their child to temple to to present Jesus as custom. And in that moment, instantly, they knew that's the Messiah. In fact, I, I think what's interesting is Simeon said, Lord, now give me that peace. He he literally said that I have seen your salvation. So before Jesus Christ was even crucified, before he died and then was raised again and saved mankind, Simeon looked at the eyes of a child and said, I have seen salvation. My heart is satisfied. God, I'm ready to come home. These two individuals, you understand, they weren't just the only two people that happened to be at at the temple temple constantly was full of people worshiping and making sacrifices and priests and and prophets and all these different people. In fact, if you were to rewind 400 years, it was the last time that any words were spoken to the nation of Israel. So there was a 400 year gap from the point in which the last words were spoken to the point in which Jesus comes onto the scene. 400 years of silence, and in that time, oh, I don't have time to go into it, but in those, in those 400 years, the presence of God wasn't even in the temple. It had left the temple. So for 400 years, they were worshiping literally at an empty room. But they went through the motions. They went through their religious op- re- uh, obligations, They did what they knew to do because all they knew was step one, two, three, repeat. One, two, three, repeat. 400 years, thousands of people made journeys. Thousands of people, animals sacrificed, prayers made, incense burned. Thousands of years, or 400 400 years. All that happens. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus, incognito as a baby. The absolute opposite form that they thought it would take, the Messiah. Brought to the temple to be presented and there are two people out of the entire group of people, 
only two of them, and by the way, led by the Spirit, only two of them recognized the Savior amongst the sea of people. Only two of them. So it's not a wonder that in our day and age that not everybody recognizes Jesus. Not everybody confesses him as Lord and Savior. We shouldn't bang our heads against the wall going, how come everyone doesn't see what we see? We have to recognize that literally the physical form of Jesus, whether it be a baby or all the way through 33 years of life on this earth, he was rejected, he was mistreated, he was forgotten, he was marginalized. So many people walked past Jesus and completely missed him. His own disciples missed him. When he was walking on the water, thought he was a ghost. So many people came, lived life with him, walked past him, and never realized who he truly was. And that wasn't because God was hiding himself. It was because there is something of responsibility that we have to be just much like the season of Advent, to be those that quiet our hearts, tune in to what God is doing, and honestly yearn for more of God, wanting more of it. That was looking to the past. That, if you will, that's the first coming of Jesus. That's the past, and we celebrate that, and we remember that. But the future is something important, too, that we must pay attention to. The future, we find in Mark, in a variety of places, but Mark chapter 13, verse 24 through 27. At that time, after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. This is talking about the end of days, the end time when Christ comes back. Verse 26. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send out his angels to gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the furthest ends of the earth and heaven. Verse 32. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And since you do not know what the time will come, be on guard, stay alert. So we have the past, which is the first coming of Christ, and then we have the future, which will be the second coming of Christ. This will be a great, powerful, and terrifying moment. (laughs) <laughs> if I can say, if you read some of the description there, if you're paying attention, I mean, in those days of anguish, the sun will be dark and the moon will give no light. That right there would just freak, ever, freak a lot of us out. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers in the heavens and the earth will be sh- shaken. I mean, that, that doesn't really sound like your typical average July day <laughs> on the shores of Lake Michigan. I mean, that's like, what is happening? But it's not left there. It's not just left with terror. It's left with God coming in all of his glory and splendor to gather from the northeast, the south, the west, from heavens and from earth, to gather those who have been faithful, those who have put their trust, and to establish a new rule and new reign and to change life, to undo all the brokenness, to change the things in this life that have hurt so many of us. That's that beautiful and powerful and terrifying day. So we have the past, we have the future, the first and the second coming of Christ, both of which Advent applies to because the the first coming is us remembering, the second coming is us with anticipation, looking forward to that moment. But where are we at? We're stuck in the middle. We're stuck in the middle between 2,000 years ago when a Savior was born and came to us and one day to which no man knows the time nor the hour where we will realize that again. Jesus himself said, talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, again, being the ideals, the the way that that heaven is handled, the truth about God, the truth about who we are, all that is consumed in the beauty of God, the kingdom of God is both here and yet to come. It's now and not yet. I was like, well, what's going on here? He's talking about the bridge that we're in right now. The bridge of we are in the middle. We have experienced and we get to experience a portion of the blessing. We get to usher in and pray for God's will in heaven to be done here on this earth. And we get to live this life out and draw as many people as we possibly can towards Christ. 
But one day, all of this suffering will be done. Every single thing will be blotted out, and it will be a big giant reset button, and it will be something that for those who have put their trust in Jesus and who are Christians, they will live for eternity in heaven, celebrating and worshiping God, and the new rule and a new government will be established here on this earth, f fully fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah. But we're in between. We're stuck in the middle, and we have to do that. And as the great theologian T. Petty once said, waiting is the hardest part. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> It's Tom Petty, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> um, growing up, we had uh, about a month before Christmas, right after Thanksgiving, uh, we would always, uh, it'd be one day, and we'd, it'd set on the calendar, my parents let us know what it was, and we would, it was an all-day event of getting ready for for Christmas. Now, at my house, we've kind of slimmed that back a little bit. Uh, just by simply having a fake tree saves tons of time. And uh, we don't decorate on the outside, so that saves a whole bunch of extra time, too. Uh, but thinking back to my childhood, um, it was an all day event. First, we'd wake up in the morning, we'd get in the car, and we wouldn't drive to the nearest tree farm or the one right after that. Or No, we would just constantly keep driving until we found the cheapest tree farm there was. Doesn't matter how much gas we spent. Doesn't matter we had to stop for food. Like the, the, the residual cost kept going up, but by goodness, we got that tree for $2 cheaper. And we'd go cut it down and we'd drag it back and put it on top of our car. And, and you guys know, you guys kind of know the rhythm because some of you guys have already done this or you're like, oh, that's right. I got to put a tree up today. Um, and we'd bring it back and, and then Myself and my brothers and my dad, we would go out and we would, we would shake the tree down and get the leaves or the, the, the needles out and we would go and set up all the decorations outside. And while that was going on, my mom would start baking and, and making cookies and all those kind of things. And, and uh, we were out there and we were putting up the nativity scene and my dad was adamant you can't put baby Jesus out until Christmas Day. So it was just Mary and Joseph just looking at each other. And, um, which makes sense, but it just was, you know. And my dad would pound a giant wood sign into our yard. And it, I can't remember what it said, but it was, it was, I can't remember. It was a verse and uh, just talking about Jesus. So it was evident that the Tice household was all about Jesus is the reason for the season. And so we'd do that, and we had all those old light bulbs, the ones you had to screw in, and they just got super hot. They are dangerous as all get out. That's the ones that we have. And so after, it felt like decades of trying to unwind the things, and getting them all set up and testing them, we come on in, and now the, now the house is starting to smell good, and we got Nat King Cole on the, on the record player, and we're ready to now decorate the tree. So my dad drags it in, and there's like a, just a, a trail of dead needles coming through the, <laughs> through the house. And we set it up, and we decorate the tree, and we're singing Christmas songs, and, and afterwards we just sit there, and we look how beautiful it is, and that was kind of our, our tradition. That was, that's just what we did, and it's not too far off from what most of you do. Now, um, my tradition at my house is a little bit different. It's by and large about the same, but um, we, uh, last night we set our tree up. It took us no time at all. Again, pre-lit trees, all right. <laughs> they even make little ornament things you can put them on and all that make them smell like pine trees. So for, for those of us who want to further the illusion. And uh, we set up, and it was so cute. My kids did all the decorations, and they laid them all out, and they organized them between whose decorations were whose and, and all that kind of stuff. And we had music playing, and, and uh, it was very nice. Fire was going and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I was really tired. And it was just kind of a long week, so I was kind of tired. And I, I wasn't overly into it until my little, our little dog, Zoe, my wife put like an outfit on Zoe. And we have a picture of it right here. And there's Zozo's with her little Christmas gown on. And then my daughter whips out this. This is Zoe's stocking with the little paws on it. And it's, and I, I'm not even like I, don't, like, I don't like not like the dog. I just don't really like the dog. There's just like, I mean, I'm in the in-between season. So I, I don't like, I'm not mad at the dog. I just not like, it's not my first thing I want to hang out with when I come home. But seeing this. Oh my goodness, this is awesome. And I used to make fun of people that would put outfits on dogs. And it's just like, come on, like at some point you've got to get a life. But when you see little Zozos in her little gown, her little, little, her little Christmassy thing, it works great. And the reason 
why I bring that up is, uh, is decorating the tree was so important for our kids. And it's something that they were looking forward to. And the moment that we announced them that, hey, you know, on Saturday or whatever day, we're, we're going to go ahead and set the tree up, like instantly our children became different people. They became not quiet and <coughs> relatively polite and clean and they washed their hands after bathroom breaks. And like, they, they just knew that I got to be on my best behavior. My wife's giving me a look like, no, they didn't. Well, yes, they did. They're on their, their best behavior relative to them. Their best behavior <laughs> because they want to have Christmas time. And every time that we have something big and special like that coming up, it's helpful to us as parents. What do I mean by that? Um, <clears throat> When you say something along the lines of, we're not going to put the tree up if your room's still messy, right? Or we're not going to get all the decorations out until all these shoes are picked up and taken care of. Well, you don't really have to argue with the kids at that point. They just take care of it. They're like, yes, yes, father. How can I please you? And they, and they just run to it. In fact, if I'm being honest, and maybe some of you mega parents out there who've got it all figured out, kudos to you. I high five you. Blessings to you. Because when you say jump, they say how high. Awesome. But for the rest of us, we've got to have leverage. We have to. My daughter just had her first sleepover. We had some girls come over and they slept over. And that was Christina. And she was so excited. And I'll be honest with you, we didn't draw it out for this particular reason, but it, was, it did seem to be drawn out for a while between the initial ask and when we actually had those children come over. And in that time span, I'm not gonna lie, life became a lot easier with Christina. <laughs> like a ton easier. Like, you know, who's gonna help daddy wash the dishes? She's like, I will. And she's right there. And I knew it the second the, the sleepover was done. Her room just went into chaos. It was like a tornado went through it. And you go as parents from those moments of expectation to moments of expectation. And that's all you have to cling on to. No, that's not bad. But it is true. And there's an element about it that we have to pay attention to. Whether it be a sleepover or decorating a tree, those are things that kids look forward to. But for us as adults, we have things that we look forward to. We have things that we pursue. We have things that are real to us and that we get excited about. And our, where, our, where our expectation is, our actions, our words, our thoughts, everything like that goes towards that. It goes in the same direction. In fact, when my daughter wanted to have that sleepover, um, we didn't even really have to ask too much for her to do things. She just knew that she wanted her house to be clean. She wanted her room to be perfect. She wanted everything organized. And she wanted to have her friends have a great time. I mean, we still had to ask her. I mean, it wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't like a free hall pass or anything like that. But it was still some work involved. But because she was excited about her friends coming over, her actions changed. The... the the outcome of expectation changed how she handled things. And that's where we're at. We're in the middle. We're in the yes, we're in the now, but not yet. The kingdom has come, and yet it's still coming. So we have to be willing to wait in a, in a godly way. We have to, just like my daughter excited about a sleepover or my children excited about putting the tree and the decorations together, we have to have our hope fixed on God every single day, not just for his second coming, but for what he's going to do in your life now. And I guess if I were to land the message on that, that's what I want to be the focus, is every single day that you wake up, all the things that I mentioned point to this. Do you have your hope fixed first on God? Is the thing that you prioritize in your time and in your prayers, God, what do you have for me today? God, I believe that you have great things. I, Lord, I want to experience all that you have. Lord, I want to minister to that person that I don't even know exists maybe, or maybe I've tried and I've failed. God, I, I want that part of my heart that's hurt and broken. I want it to be healed. You, 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 Put all of your eggs, if you will, in one basket. And we're told not to do that in this world, but in the hands of God, that is a safe and appropriate place. Simeon, Prophet Anna, that's what they were doing. It didn't matter how long, day and night, praying and fasting, never relenting. 
they knew a savior was coming and they weren't gonna stop until that was realized. I wonder if any of us would have that same conviction. Because we're not waiting for a child, a Messiah to be born that's already happened. And we're not called to put our lives on pause just waiting for God to come the second time. We are called to live life with God. So are you doing that? Can you honestly say that every day when you wake up and all throughout the day that you are prioritizing God? You're spending time in prayer and talking to God. When, instead of listening to just whatever on the radio, you're listening to Christian music. And not that that saves you, but it reconnects you to God. Are you coming to church? Are you, are you praying and are you fasting? Are you giving your heart to God? Are you finding and carving out those little moments because it doesn't just happen in a passive way. We have to be intentional about it. This is something that, like a muscle that has to be worked out. We have to be people like Simeon and the prophet Anna who are expecting greatness from God, who our dreams are only fulfilled by what God is doing in our lives. Romans chapter eight, verse 22, this is all the message version. This is a different way of reading through this, but it talks about how we need to wait patiently, expectantly, and prayerfully. I love how this is talking about us as a people, knowing that there's more to come. All around us, we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pains. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. This is why waiting doesn't diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us, but the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. So in a moment and a season of waiting, whether it be these four weeks of Advent or for the rest of our lives, like a pregnant woman, we carry the burden, we carry the reality, we carry something that is growing and changing on the inside of us. We have to know that when we do that, when we allow ourselves to be fully fixed on God and we allow him to grow us and for us, our lives to be changed in him, when that takes place, just like it says here, that the waiting doesn't diminish us. It doesn't, doesn't diminish us having to wait and us being in between isn't like this, like, oh, we're in this bad place and we've been left just to wait between the first coming and the second coming. No, we're in this beautiful place of being grown and being changed. And the longer we wait, and the longer God refines us and changes us from the inside out, the more that happens, the greater our expectancy is and the joy that comes from that expectancy being realized. It's a beautiful thing. I want to end with this, this quote talking about uh, like trapeze artists. They're usually families that go around in circuses. My family and I went to a circus a year or so back, and they had the people that would you know, jump through the air and flip in the air, and they would do all these crazy things, things I would never even attempt. But there, there's something important that was written about them, and I think it has a spiritual impact on us. There's a special relationship between the flyer and the catcher on the trapeze. The flyer is the one that lets go, and the catcher is the one that catches. As the flyer swings high above the crowd on the trapeze, the moment comes when he must let go. He arcs out into the air. His job is to remain as still as possible and wait for the strong hands of the catcher to pluck him from the air. The flyer must never try to catch the catcher. The flyer must wait in absolute trust. The catcher will catch him, but he must wait. The importance of the fact that our role is to be the flyer. Our role is to, to let go, to, uh, to be out there and to say, God, in complete peace and with patience and with my life being committed to you, 
I will simply reside in this place. And with my trust in you, I will not try to grab at you. I will not try to force the situation, but I will close my eyes and I will stretch out my hands and I will allow my loving father who sent his son, I will allow you to grab me and to catch me. But wait, I must. So my encouragement for you, and I know this isn't necessarily a message of, of here's practical one, two, three, and four, but actually all I want you to walk away with is this for this week. Every single day this week, write it on your hand, write it somewhere, put it down somewhere where you cannot ignore it. God, am I waiting on you? Not just for a season of Advent, the first and second coming, but God, am I waiting on you for what you want to do in my life today? I, I ask yourself, am I prioritizing God? Do I really want him in my life? Have I truly let go of my bar and released my hand so that he can catch me, or am I trying to run this myself? We need to wait and know, just like Simeon and the prophet Anna, and know that in the right timing and just the right way, our God, every single time, moment by moment, day by day, will be there, will show up strong and in powerful ways, and he will change our lives. The rest of the world may miss him. Let's not be the rest of the world. What a sad commentary on the lives of the Pharisees and the religious leaders that they literally spent their lives trying to find this Messiah and then when he showed up, they completely missed him. What a sad, sad reality.